honored and uh, happy to have with us uh, our guest speaker for tonight, Dennis Coates of the uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Uh, he is, um, uh, he received his PhD, he's a professor of economics, and uh, he received his PhD in economics from uh, the University of Maryland, College Park, uh, and was on the faculty of, uh, the, of the UNC Chapel Hill before moving to uh, University, University of Maryland, Baltimore County in uh, 1995, and his work focuses on political, political economy, uh, public policy issues, um, and public policy issues with an emphasis on sports economics, and tonight he's going to talk to us about the uh, public funding of uh, sports stadiums. Um, do taxpayers benefit from subsidies for sports facilities and events? So thank you very much, Dennis, for coming. Happy to do it. Thank you for the invitation. So uh, just as a, a basic introduction to, to my talk, this uh, happy conjunction of events, me going to Baltimore and the Browns going to Baltimore, happened at the same time. And all through the fall of 1995, there were reports about how building a stadium for the then Cleveland Browns to become whatever, they didn't actually have a name for a while, the Baltimore football franchise was going to generate 3,500 full-time equivalent jobs. So you build the stadium, have it filled eight, maybe nine or ten times in a season, and you're going to have 3,500 people with full-time jobs year-round. And I read that, and I thought, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. What a crock. That can't possibly be true. So I talked to a colleague of mine, Brad Humphreys, who was across the hall from me at the time. Now he's in Alberta, so I don't know what that says. Um, but we talked about this, and so we collected a, a great deal of data for about 30 years, 35 years, on all of the cities that ever had a team in the NFL, the NBA, or Major League Baseball. And we did some statistical analysis to find out what happens if you have a team show up into your city where you didn't have one before. What happens if a team that you had leaves? Of course, Baltimore is kind of uh, unique in that regard because they've both experienced a team stolen away from them in the middle of the night by a drunken reprobate who took it to Indianapolis and also stole a team from another city. So they've experienced both, but you have a lot of different kinds of experiences with expansion and so on. Teams are cities building stadiums, and so we wanted to know, if you look over time for a large number of cities, would you be able to find evidence that when a team shows up or when they build a new stadium, that in fact the claims of the proponents were true. And the claims of the proponents were things like incomes will go up, or they'll grow faster, or we'll have more jobs, it'll generate uh, economic development of one form or another. And so that's why the local government, whether it's the city, the county, or the state, should put 200, 400, a billion dollars into building a stadium. We wanted to know if those sorts of claims were correct. So uh, this is sort of the culmination of a long period of time working on a variety of issues related to sports. So being a little more recent, thinking about the Super Bowl where the Baltimore Ravens became the world champions, just had to say that, um, the New Orleans Tourism Corporation said that hosting the Super Bowl would have an economic impact of $432 million. I'm always tempted to do one of these, $432 million. You know that, um, no, maybe not. Maybe I don't do it right. Maybe it's this way. Anyways, $432 million. Now, compare that to the New Orleans metropolitan area GDP. These are um, also for 2011 because that's the most recent number. That's $80,154 million. So $432 million doesn't sound like all that much compared to $80,154 million. In fact, it's one half of 1%. Doesn't sound like such a big deal when you put it in those terms, right? But if somebody came up to you and said, here, I'll give you $432 million, I'm pretty sure there's nobody here that would say no. But if you were told, I'll give you one half of 1% of your income, you might say, well, thank you, but what's the big deal? 
Let's put this in a little bit more um, sort of context. The New Orleans metropolitan area had a population of 1.2 million people in 2011. So if you divide that economic impact out, that's about $360 per person. Now, if somebody's going to write you a check for $360, I suspect that you'd be willing to accept that, right? So that sounds like it's a pretty good deal. Okay, let's do that. Unfortunately, they haven't accounted for any of the costs of generating that $400 million or this $360 per person. What costs have they not accounted for? Well, they did not account for the fact that they spent $305 million to upgrade the New Orleans airport. $305 million out of 400 and whatever it was, 32, you've already used a good chunk of that $432 million up. $13 million for roads and bridges. $11 million for sidewalks and street signs. Now, you might say, but wait a minute. The airport's going to be there long after the Super Bowl. Those roads and bridges are going to be usable for a long time after the Super Bowl. The sidewalks and the street signs are all going to be there for a long time after the Super Bowl. So it's really not fair to count those as the costs. And you're right, that's true. It's not fair to count those as the costs. But then I ask you this question. Aren't those projects worth doing without doing a Super Bowl? If it makes sense to upgrade your airport, why doesn't it make sense to upgrade your airport independent of whether you host the Super Bowl? I mean, New Orleans is a tourist place. You'd think having an attractive airport would be beneficial whether or not the Super Bowl was in town. So we have to ask ourselves questions like, is this Super Bowl really the only reason we can do important public investments like making sure the bridges don't fall down? Including in the sidewalks and street signs are making the streets in uh, the uh, sidewalks in Bourbon Street handicapped accessible under the Ad Americans with Disabilities Act. What does that have to do with the Super Bowl? Shouldn't they do that anyway? but they only could do it because of the Super Bowl. So, many, many times there's lots and lots of reasons to subsidize. Proponents of subsidies tout these, trot them out, have the press report them, and we're gonna talk about some of them. Economic growth. So, as I mentioned with respect to the Baltimore Ravens, it's important that you think about economic growth. This is a project where the local government, whether it's the city, the county, or the state, is going to invest in the community with the express purpose of having the economy develop. Economic growth you can think of related in two ways. One is income creation. Now the thing about income creation is that when you think about it, and the way the proponents talk about it, it's never quite clear what they mean. Will the average income go up, or will income grow up, go up faster than it used to? Now those two things are not the same, right? Having everybody's income go up by $100, a one-time shot, or having it grow at a faster rate forever are not the same thing but the proponents are never quite clear on which of those two things it is. And the reason I point this out is because in that very first study that Humphreys and I did, so here's the, the level or the rate of increase, that very first study that Humphreys and I did back in 1995, one of the things that we did was examined what happened to the level of income and what happened to the growth rate of income. And the answer with respect to the growth rate is not one thing which as an economist is really, really encouraging to me because when I think about economic growth and the determinants of economic growth, the things I think about are knowledge, technology, more capital stock, equipment to work with. Those are the things that should make the economy produce more stuff per unit of input. 
not whether or not you put up a football stadium or a baseball stadium or a hockey arena. Those things should not affect economic growth rates. And fortunately for our study, they didn't find that they would. But then there's also the level. And in our analysis, we had, um, as, I, as I briefly mentioned a minute ago, we had several different variables, what we called the sports environment. We had the capacity of the stadiums in the community, whether they were uh, football stadiums or baseball stadiums or um, hockey and basketball arenas. We had the number of franchises and whether a franchise had come into the community in the last 10 years or left the community in the last 10 years. We had um, whether a new stadium had been constructed and it was uh, a, an arena or a football stadium. We controlled for whether or not they were multi-use facilities. So it used to be, though it's very rare these days, that when a stadium was built, it was built for both the baseball team and the football team. So when our data started in the, the late 1960s, there were several multi-use stadiums uh, that you may be familiar with. So Veterans Stadium in Philadelphia, Three Rivers Stadium, Riverfront, a variety of them were multi-use stadiums. The most recent phenomenon is not to have that, that the baseball team and the football team cannot possibly play in the same venue. And so we had this huge array of sports environment variables, and our statistical tests indicated that, in fact, those variables clearly were, as a group, and some of them individually, statistically significant determinants of the level of income in the community. And we were pretty surprised by that, except they made it go down. They made it go down. So rather than this sports environment making everybody richer, the, the evidence was that the sports environment made everybody poorer. Now, that's a little bit of an exaggeration. It isn't necessarily that people were poorer in some sort of absolute sense. Really what it means as a possibility is that our estimates were telling us essentially what people were willing to pay to have the access to this full array of sports. To live in a community that has an NFL franchise, a Major League Baseball franchise, an NBA franchise, people were willing to take slightly lower incomes to do so. In the same way that you would take slightly lower income to have a particularly attractive job, or that you would pay more to live in a house that's close to really good schools or next to a park, called a compensating differential. That was one of our explanations. Other explanations had to do with things like, well, you know, professional athletes make a lot of money. They make a lot of money, far more than the average citizen. And in making a lot of money, what do rich people do with their lots of money? Particularly rich people who have a very, very short earning life. So if you're gonna only work for 10 years, and you're going to earn $500,000 a year, you're probably going to have to save a lot of that money if you plan on having anything beyond your 10-year career. So you had quite wealthy people, wealthier than average, earning a lot of money for a very short period of time, and so they save a lot, which means that money that would have been spent, and I imagine people have heard of the multiplier analysis, rather than having an injection, you have a leakage, a relatively large leakage because you have high income earners saving a lot of money. Oh, and I, mentioned, I failed to mention one other thing. You know, one, one startling fact about professional athletes, they almost never live where they play. For some reason, they all find their way to South Florida or Southern California or Louisiana or something. They tend not to live where they play. So they get a lot of money, they save a lot of it, more than, the more than the typical person, and they take it out of the community with them. 
all of that combines to make the level of income actually lower because of the sports environment. Now, it's also possible that what's happening is um, important public projects don't get done. Like what? Well, like paving the roads, maintaining the bridges. And what happens if the roads are full of potholes? What happens if the bridges are not well maintained? Well, business doesn't work so well. It's expensive to ship stuff by road when your trucks are blowing out a tire or breaking an axle on crummy highways, when they have to go a long way around because the roads are not in good shape. These are costs that are borne by business and everybody else that never show up directly. But maybe they show up in the community being less productive at what they do. So there's a variety of reasons why the level of income may be lower. Another argument is this subsidy for a stadium or a professional sports franchise creates jobs. I cited the 3,500 jobs that would be created with the construction of uh, the football stadium in Baltimore. It's interesting that if you look at the sort of economic impact reports done for a variety of construction projects of this nature, you'll get about 3,500 jobs will be generated in New York, in Memphis, Oklahoma City, Baltimore, Tuscaloosa. Doesn't matter where you are. It's going to generate 3,500 jobs, give or take a couple hundred. Doesn't that seem a little odd that it would generate the same number of jobs in a city of 20 million people and in the city of 400,000 people? That seems a little strange to me. But that's the kind of results that you get, which mean that maybe something strange is going on here. The second part of this is job creation and income creation are the same thing, right? They're just two different ways of measuring the same thing. They're not two different benefits. They are different ways of talking about the same benefit. And so the reports typically, the reasons to subsidize will typically say, well, it'll generate income and it'll create jobs. Well, yeah, but they're the same thing. Also, we hear stories that they'll generate tax revenues, which is kind of interesting because many, many of the stadiums and arenas that have been subsidized have gotten big tax breaks. For example, the land that they sit on is tax-free. For example, there's no sales tax charged on items purchased within the arena or the stadium. So you've got this story that it will generate tax revenues, and then you've also got sort of tax breaks that reduce the revenues that will be generated. So what are some more reasons to subsidize? Uh, call these other benefits. The big league city effect or the big league city story. So what does that mean? It means that if you host, if you build a stadium and attack, attract a franchise, you become a world class or a big, big league city. Now I want you to think about what that means, world class or big league city. And there's a couple of different ways to think about it. First, how many clubs are necessary for a city to become a big league city? Is it one? If you have one, say you have a major league baseball club, but you don't have a football club, you don't have a hockey club, you don't have NBA, you don't have major league soccer, you just have the one, are you big city or not? Well, it probably depends on the city, right? Probably depends on the city. One might be not enough, but it also might be unnecessary. So Los Angeles with and without the Los Angeles Rams. So many of you are too young to remember, but the Los Angeles Rams used to be, well, they were the Los Angeles Rams before they became the St. Louis Rams. Is Los Angeles not a big league city because they don't have the Rams anymore? I would suspect that most people would say no. It still is a big league city. It doesn't matter if the Rams are there or not. 
it's still a big league city. How many clubs are sufficient to make you a big league city? And so I'll give you the LA versus Green Bay. Is Green Bay a big league, a world-class city? Is Jacksonville? It's hard for me to imagine that many people would say, yes, Jacksonville and Green Bay are big league, world-class cities. Because they've got an NFL franchise. But Los Angeles that doesn't is not a world-class city. And now, if you've got one, do you need a second one? What's the increment of world-classness that you get from having a second professional sports franchise? What's the increment of world-classness that you get from having a third professional sports franchise? I mean, if that's the case, then Green Bay should be arguing very vociferously to get an NBA franchise in there, right? Because then they would be twice the world-class city that they are now. So big league city, a sense of community. Oops. Sense of community. This is the, the one that I have the most, um, most sympathy for, a sense of community. There's nothing like a professional sports franchise to bring people together. And all you have to do is see the way people celebrate after a team wins a championship where you've got all sorts of people celebrating in the same way. They're <laughs> enjoying the outcome. When the Ravens won the Super Bowl, in my neighborhood, people were shooting off fireworks. Professional people and people who have, you know, blue collar jobs, students, all sorts of people, all celebrating. They all have something to talk about. They all have a sense of community pride about the football team. That's all absolutely wonderful, and I agree that that stuff exists. How much is it worth? How many dollars is it? I don't know. Unfortunately, almost nobody does. That doesn't mean that it's zero just because we don't know, but it does mean that we don't know if it's enough to justify spending $400 million to build a stadium. And that's the key thing, we don't know. But there are very real benefits from this, we just don't know what they are. And then consumer and producer surplus. So consumer surplus, producer surplus, the benefits, the amount that you're willing to pay for something over and above what you actually do pay for it. And clearly that's the case. We know that people will pay more than $100 for a ticket to the Super Bowl because they pay thousands of dollars for them. In fact, we know people will pay more than $100 for a ticket to a regular season Baltimore Ravens game because people routinely pay far more than that. But the face value of the ticket is 100 bucks. So we know that people are willing to pay more for it than the face value, than the amount that they actually do have to pay at the ticket booth, so to speak, and that's consumer surplus. That's another thing, we don't really have a good handle on how much that is. Likewise for producer surplus. But the other part of this is whose surpluses count? Whose surpluses count? And this a little bit goes back to the community benefits. We certainly can know could estimate the surpluses received by the people who buy tickets. The sports fans who go to the game because they purchased a ticket to do so. That's a consumer surplus. What we don't know is how much some people would pay to keep that stuff away from their town. The negative side of it, we don't know what that is. So suppose that you are an opera fan and you absolutely hate professional football. You're disgusted by the fact that your city has professional football. Nobody asks you how much you would be willing to pay to keep them away. But if we're really going to tote up the costs and the benefits and figure out whether it was worth doing, we need to know that as well. Unfortunately, we don't ever ask that. So 
we have a variety of reasons for subsidizing stadiums, mostly put forward by people who would like to build a stadium to attract a new franchise, all of which are a little bit suspect as real measures of benefits. Consumer and producer surpluses are not suspect as measures of, of the real benefits. The problem is that we just don't know what they are because we've never really done much of an estimate of them. We've done some. And we certainly don't know about the benefits that are to the broader community. So for example, take me. I haven't been to a football game at um, M&T Bank Stadium in Baltimore in about five years. The tickets are 100 bucks a piece, and I can watch it on TV for a lot cheaper than 100 bucks a piece and probably get a better view than I would be able to get. I clearly derive benefits from doing so, but there's no market to measure what my benefit is. So we don't know how, much, how big those benefits are. We know that they exist, but we don't know their value. So when we think about whether it's a good idea to subsidize or not subsidize, we have these difficult problems. There's arguments made for why it's a good idea, most of which are hooey, and there's good reasons for, that you should measure to find out if it's a good idea, and it's either really hard or kind of hard and never been done. So we don't really have super good ideas about most of this stuff. Well, I want to give you some visual evidence, and I don't know, um, this, this comes from a book by Delaney and Eckstein. In their book, um, Delaney and Eckstein, one of them is a sociologist and the other is a political scientist, I think, um, from Temple and Villanova, though which one is which, I'm not sure. If you could see this, you would see that that light part is, it says dome souvenirs. So around the Metrodome in Minneapolis, they went there and they took pictures, wandered around in that area, and looked for the signs of economic development as a result of building the Metrodome in Minneapolis. The only thing that they could find that was new after the Metrodome was this place called Dome Souvenirs. Now, you can't really see it very well, but it's not exactly an attractive building. <laughs> That's all they could find. This one is in near Coors Field in Denver. And this one you really can't see, but money to loan. So, you know, it's like a check cashing place, bail bondsman, uh, next thing up, or yeah, next thing above loan shark. <laughs> That's the only evidence of economic development in the neighborhood. And you can actually see there um, in the top right the, um, the light structures for Coors Field. This is the only thing that they could find as economic development in that neighborhood. Now these, you know, I'd say, you might say, oh, but you found two examples. I can find lots of examples where it's otherwise. And the answer is, Yes, you can find examples where it's otherwise. In fact, I live close to one. It's called Nationals Park in Washington, D.C., or the Verizon Center in Washington, D.C. They will, the people from Washington who pushed those ideas will be happy to tell you what a great thing they were because they generated all this development. And if you go to the Verizon Center especially, you'll see lots of bars and restaurants in the neighborhood. And you might be tempted to believe that yes, in fact, there was a big benefit here because there's all these bars and restaurants around. And this isn't anything about bars. I go to bars all the time. It's not a complaint that that's what was there. The complaint is different. The complaint that I'm going to raise about these things has to do with redistribution of income. And there's a variety of ways that income is redistributed. The first is spatially. 
Spatial redistribution means that if you look at a map, you take money from this section of the map and you move it to that section of the map. You didn't make it any bigger, you didn't make more income, you just moved it from one place to another. That's spatial redistribution. Another kind is from fans to owners and players. From fans to owners and players. So, and I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but what happens when a new stadium opens? Ticket prices go up. So the amount that you were willing to pay to a game probably didn't change much, but the amount that they're taking out of your pocket when you go to a game changes a lot. Depending on the sport, it varies, but for the NFL, as much as 35%. Open a new stadium and raise your ticket prices 35%. So that's from fans to owners and players. Also from moderate and low income people to uh, middle and upper income people. So in the state of Maryland, the stadiums are partially paid for by a lottery. If you know anything about lotteries, you know that typically lottery players are poorer or less educated. But at $100 a crack, for the cheapest tickets, you don't get a lot of very poor people going to the stadium to watch the games. So the relatively low income people pay for the stadium that the relatively high income people get to enjoy. So from moderate and low income people to middle and upper income people. And from non-sports fans to sports fans. So if you never attend sports, you never go, uh, you never watch the games on television, you still, in many instances, have to pay. So, for example, in Wisconsin, when they um, started to pay for um, remodeling Lambeau Field, where the Green Bay Packers play, one of the things they did was raise the county sales tax. Everybody pays the county sales tax, whether they go to games or not, whether they ever watched a football game on TV or not. So you have now non-sports fans who are subsidizing the leisure activities of sports fans. Now let me emphasize, before you get some impression that may be an incorrect perception or impression, that I'm some wild-eyed, crazy guy who hates sports. I get asked that all the time. I don't hate sports. I've played sports my whole life. I'm a sports fan. I didn't start studying sports economics because I don't like sports. I like sports a lot. What I don't like is bad public policy sold to us on bad arguments. If you could convince me with a good argument that it was a good idea, I would say, fine, let's do that. But mostly you can't. So let's talk about spatial redistribution. FedEx Field is the football stadium where the Washington Redskins play. And FedEx Field was built um, by the late Jack Kent Cooke, who was the owner of the Redskins, because he felt that the stadium that his team was playing in, RFK Stadium, which is essentially in the city of Washington, uh, was not adequate. And in some respects, I would have to agree. Stadiums, newer stadiums, have luxury boxes and you know, all sorts of different perks that an older stadium like RFK would not have. So he's clear, it was clearly correct. So he wanted to build this stadium, and he, for the most part, did, with his own money, build FedEx Field. But not entirely, because there were $75 million worth of, of infrastructure upgrades, meaning they had to put a new ramp into the Washington Beltway. Uh, they had to lay new sewer lines just for the stadium and things like that, and it, it came to $75 million. One of the arguments that was made here was, uh, you know, this is going to be great for the state of Maryland. And PG, the PG there is Prince George's County, which is where the stadium is. This will be great because it'll be in Prince George's County instead of Washington. Likewise for Camden Yards in Baltimore. Camden Yards is where the Orioles play. It's also where the M&T Bank Stadium, where the Ravens play. They're both side by side. Um, the Ravens, when they first moved to Baltimore, and the Orioles until 92,
played in a place called Memorial Stadium. So in that case, basically the Inner Harbor and Federal Hill, that's where the new stadiums essentially are, gained at the expense of these other two neighborhoods, Charles Village and Waverly. Charles Village is really close to Johns Hopkins University. In fact, basically the one side of Memorial Stadium was the undergraduate campus of Johns Hopkins University. Well, here's RFK and FedEx. So I got this off of Google Maps, and you can see that um, in the bottom left there, that's where RFK Stadium is, and you follow it over, follow the blue line, that takes you to where FedEx Field is. Following the road, it's eight miles. Is that really going to have, for that metropolitan area, a big impact on the local economy? No. All it did was move a bunch of spending from that area called Northeast Washington over to this area called Prince George's County that were eight miles apart. Yes, they're two different political jurisdictions. That's why I called it robbing DC to pay PG. Nobody was going to bars and restaurants in the neighborhood of RFK Stadium anymore because they would go to places closer to FedEx Field if they went to any. Eight miles. Here's Nationals Park and RFK. Now, you might not realize it because of the scaling here, but those two are about three to four miles apart. And they're both in the District of Columbia. How could that possibly be all that big a deal for the city of Washington to move their baseball stadium three miles? And then here's the last one, uh, Memorial Stadium to Camden Yards. Memorial Stadium is up at the top. Homestead is basically um, Johns Hopkins. And Camden Yards is down here in the lovely area called Pigtown. That's about four miles, all within the Baltimore City metropolitan area, uh, Baltimore City um, boundaries. So this is spatial redistribution. All you're doing is moving economic activity from one, one part of town to another part of town. You're not creating anything, you're moving it around. So wealth redistribution or income redistribution, revenues to clubs. Now here's the thing that's happened over time. As new stadiums get built, what franchises have been able to do is essentially to say, if you don't build us a stadium, we'll go someplace else. And because of things like the Baltimore Colts going in the middle of a snowstorm in the dead of night to Indianapolis, that's a credible threat. The Oakland Raiders going from Oakland to Los Angeles and then back again. We see that it's a credible threat to pick up your team and move it someplace. And so cities that don't want to lose, they're going to agree to deals. And one of the deals is the revenues that the clubs will get when they play in those stadiums. Concessions, so all of the concession money goes to the club all of the parking. So around the stadiums in Baltimore, there's plenty of public parking. And it's downtown. There's public parking garages. On game day, the revenue from all of that parking, rather than going to the city, goes to the club, either the Ravens or the Orioles. So they get the parking revenue. They get all of the advertising revenues. So the city and the state build the stadium, and then the team sells basically billboards inside it and generates revenue on that. Revenues um, from advertising in the game day programs. In fact, here's an interesting story about Sorry if I bore you with Baltimore, but it's the one I know best. If you watch a baseball game, 
you know, one of the shots on TV that you see the most is kind of behind the pitcher towards the batter, and you often see billboard kind of things flashing behind them. Well, the technology exists to show that on TV, but not have it in the stadium. You know, I'd say, well, what difference does that make? And the answer is because in some places, the agreement is that the city and the team share the revenues from inside the stadium advertising. But if you use this technology to superimpose that advertisement on the screen, it's not in the stadium. And guess who doesn't get a share? The city doesn't get a cut of that anymore. So even when they're supposed to be sharing revenues, there's ways to get around it from, from the advertising. Naming rights. So, you know, the city or the state builds the stadium, and the club has the authority to sell the name of the stadium to the highest bidder for whatever money they can get. So, again, I'll give you the example of Baltimore. When it first opened, the stadium that's now M&T Bank was PSI Net Stadium. PSI Net was an internet company, and like many internet companies in the mid-1990s, it had lots and lots of, or a very high stock value without ever producing one damn thing. No revenues to account for all of its high stock values because it didn't actually produce anything. Well, you can imagine that when the internet stock bubble burst, that stock went down. So after selling for a couple hundred dollars a share, it then sold for a couple of cents a share. And this company that had agreed to pay a million dollars a year or more to have its name on the stadium no longer could pay the million dollars a year, defaulted on its agreement, and so the club got to sell the name again and they sold it to M&T Bank. So naming rights. And this is kind of a scam too, because oftentimes if you look at a newspaper article, it'll say, well, the club's contribution to stadium costs is this many million dollars. What it doesn't tell you is oftentimes some of that money comes from the naming rights. So the city builds the stadium gives the naming rights to the club for free, the club sells them and says that's its contribution to the value, to the construction value. In other words, you sell the gift that I give you and give it back to me and you call that your contribution. Why isn't that just my contribution? Okay, so we have naming rights. Schedule control. It, this is an interesting one, too. Many of the facilities, the control over who gets to be in there is entirely in the hands of the club. So uh, in the last couple of years, I've been to a couple of, of what are called friendly soccer matches. They bring clubs over from Europe. Um, I saw the teams Inter Milan and Manchester City, one from the Italian Soccer League and one from the English Premier League play in Baltimore. Guess who got the revenues from that? The Baltimore Ravens. <laughs> the Baltimore Ravens. In fact, to get, get tickets to this soccer match, you had to go to the Baltimore Ravens website. Now, of course, they had to pay the two clubs out of the money as well, so it wasn't just pure profit to them. but. Um, the city didn't get anything. So the schedule control. More wealth redistribution. So ticket price increases. I mentioned this one already. In the NFL, after a stadium opens, the, the average is between 24 and 34 percent. The ticket price increase is about that much after. It's a little bit lower in the other leagues, but similar. More luxury boxes and fewer other seats. So what do they do? Well, you know, we make a lot more money if we can sell a box area, box seats, for 
$500,000 to Corporation X than if we can sell the 30 seats that might fit into that area or 40 seats that might fit into that area to just 30 or 40 Joe Schmo's fans. So instead of putting in regular seating to accommodate more regular Joes, we'll put in a luxury box that generates a lot more revenue for us, meaning that the taxpayer who's funding this has less chance to attend. Now, it's perfectly sensible on the part of the clubs to do this, both because it generates more revenue and because in a league where they share revenues, so in the National Football League, for example, the home team gets 60% and the visiting team gets 40% of the ticket revenues for just general seating. But for luxury boxes, the visiting team doesn't get anything. So if you're the home team, you want lots and lots of luxury boxes because you don't have to give any of that money to the visiting team. And so there's a very strong incentive for clubs to produce stadiums with more and more luxury boxes. So the good news about all of this, sort of, in economic terms, we should think about marginal costs and marginal benefits, right? And optimum occurs when marginal cost equals marginal benefit. That's going to be when you have, you know, the, the profit maximization. It's when you're going to have utility maximization. It's going to be when it's, in effect, socially optimal. And so what do we know? Well, if you do a correct accounting, of the benefits, and you do a correct accounting of the costs, which there isn't an awful lot of that, what you find is that it may be really close to marginal costs equal marginal benefits, or a, a wash. Okay, so it may be that it's not a complete waste of money. The argument here, though, is not that it creates income or that it creates jobs. The argument here is when you do the correct accounting of benefits, what you're counting are things like the consumer and producer surpluses. The value to the people who watch the games at home on TV, who enjoy it, but never purchase tickets. They don't ever demonstrate their value through an actual purchase. These things, when you add them up, and when you correctly count the costs, they're roughly the same. So they may be that benefits are almost as big, maybe a, even in some instances a little bit bigger than the costs. That's what we would call positive net present value if the benefits are greater than the costs. Positive net present value, okay? And having a positive net present value means that it's not a waste of money. Unfortunately, positive net present value isn't the only criteria you should satisfy. You've got limited resources. And when you've got limited resources, you don't just willy-nilly put your money into the projects that give you positive net present value, but you find those with the greatest positive net present value to do first. And so that's the bad news about the good news. Positive net present value isn't sufficient. It's necessary for it to be a good investment, but it's not sufficient. In fact, what we need to have to make a wise choice is to think about all of the other alternative ways that we could invest this money, figure out what their net present values are, and then do the one that has the highest net present value first, the one that's got the second highest net present value second, and so on. And that may be that the stadium subsidy is right there at the top, but it also may be that the stadium subsidy falls down on the bottom of the list, say below repaving the streets and make sure, making sure that the bridges don't fall down, updating the airport, 
not having to lay off police officers or close down fire stations, or even giving a tax cut. Who knows? There's lots of different ways that we could generate positive net present value. We should invest in the ones that have those projects that have the greatest positive net present value, not just a positive net present value. Okay, so what are the net present values of the other uses of funds? So, informed citizen decisions, thinking about society's interests. So, what do you take away from this? What should I do when I'm trying to make a decision about supporting or not supporting the subsidy? If you're trying to think about society's interests, the first thing that you should do is discount any claims about income creation and job creation and tax revenue creation. The scientific evidence, when I say scientific, I mean done by people who aren't in the employ of football clubs or baseball clubs or the people who want to build a stadium, but people who don't really have an ax to grind here. The evidence is that none of that stuff really is in evidence. Those things don't happen or they don't happen nearly as much as the proponents claim. So discount those things. Ask about bang for the buck. Which way would we get the best result from spending money on public projects? What would be the best thing to do? Not just what's a positive thing to do, but what's the best thing to do? Now, what about for the individual so suppose that there's a referendum, and there are frequently referendums on these things. How should you vote? Well, you have to make that decision for yourself, but let me suggest to you a way to think about it. Suppose that you will never enter the facility. You will never go there to experience a game. Okay, you'll never do that. And then ask yourself, if I never go to a game, would I generate for, would my family generate roughly $40 a year of enjoyment from watching games on TV, talking about the team with my friends over beers, on the, at the water cool, cooler, when I'm in the elevator with the maintenance guy, Am I going to generate, over the course of the year, roughly $40 worth of enjoyment for my family of four? The $40 is actually essentially what Humphreys and I got in our, our paper back from 1995. It was published in 1999, but 95 is when, when we were doing it. And so the answer to that question, if it's yes, yes, we're going to generate that much benefit personally whether we ever attend a game or not, then you should support the subsidy. Because you personally would probably generate more benefit than it cost you in terms of the lower income. If the answer to that question is no, then you should oppose the subsidy. Now notice that this is not the same thing as whether there's a positive net present value, right? There's, this isn't, is this the best thing for society? This is, is this the best thing for me? I want this or I don't want this. Am I going to benefit 40 bucks worth or am I not? If I'm going to benefit 40 bucks worth, then let's do it. And I don't care if it's not a good idea in sort of a grand social scheme. I don't care if it redistributes income from poor people to rich people. I don't care about any of that. I get more than $40 worth of benefit, do it. If you're not gonna get more than $40 worth of benefit, oppose it. Thank you. Any questions? Convention center uh, that's that's being built there, which is costing it costs over six hundred million dollars. I was going to ask if there's a similar uh, kind of result for convention centers uh, as there is for stadiums. There is a little bit. I mean, certainly, um, 
certainly in the sense that there's a limited number of conventions that can be hosted. And so as everybody has a convention center, you're basically building ever more elaborate places, chasing the same sort of fixed number of, of um, events to host. Uh, the same arguments are always made that it'll generate a great deal of, of economic activity around the, the uh, location. Um, I don't know of any specific studies that have, have said, all right, let's look at cities over time as they've developed these. Um, my intuition is that it's the same kind of a result because I've driven past the Baltimore Convention Center and <laughs> there's pretty much nothing there. The arguments are always the same. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, I don't know about sports, but that makes me think. Um, if there aren't any subsidies or if they're built now, not subsidized for you, do you pay if they get built? Does someone still do it? Um, well, the, the short answer is yes, they still get built. The longer answer is that um, sometimes teams move. And sometimes they come back with a different request. So give you the example of San Francisco. San Francisco Giants wanted San Francisco to build them a stadium. And so they put it to a vote, a referendum. And it was rejected. Now this would have been basically San Francisco's taxpayers pay 100% of the cost. It was rejected. So they come back with a second proposal a little while later. And they've lowered the share that's going to be paid by the taxpayer. And that one's rejected. And they come back with a third one. They've lowered the share that'll be paid by the taxpayer a little bit more. And that one passes. So in the, the way I jokingly refer to this is no is never for good. Yes is always for good. So you can say no forever and ever. There's nothing to stop them from coming back with another proposal again. But once you said yes, you got it. <laughs> you can't start halfway, and go, oh, you know what, maybe this wasn't a good idea. Stop digging the hole, stop laying the bricks. That, that never happens. Um, so typically, uh, there will be some sort of a subsidy or a team will leave. As the Oilers left Houston and came to Nashville with a stop for one season in Memphis, actually. Um, the Ravens left, Balt uh, left Cleveland and went to Baltimore. The, the Colts left Baltimore and went to Indianapolis. The Washington Nationals left Montreal as the Expos and ended up in Washington. Um, the Oklahoma City Thunder left Seattle and went to Oklahoma City. So if you don't get what you want, you leave. Now, um, just to, to point out something, uh, anybody know much about European football, European soccer? Almost nobody. Well, in, in European sports, um, they have what's called promotion and relegation. And what that means is that there will be a top league, and then a second league, and a third league, and so on. And what happens at the end of the season is that if you're in the top league, but you're in the bottom three, and it depends, it varies a little bit across leagues, you're in the bottom three, the next season you're in the lower tier. And the top three teams in the lower tier move up into the top tier. So teams are moving up and down between levels of competition, but they never basically move from one city to another. That idea is just completely foreign to them. No pun intended, saying, since it's in Europe. Uh, it's unbelievable to them that a team could leave a city like that, because in a European setting, those are really clubs. It's like. It's like if, uh, I don't know, if the local Kiwanis, the local Moose Club, or um, Daughters of the American Revolution were to say, ah, let's stop being here and let's move over to that city on the other side of the world. It would just wouldn't happen, right? It'd be like taking your whole family and moving. And that's what it would be for them, basically. It'd be like moving the whole family. It would never happen but they do this promotion and relegation. So what happens is they have far, far less local subsidies for sports franchises because there's no threat of moving. Nobody would believe it. 
Which, and that's one of the things that fascinates me if you know anything about the New York Yankees. The New York Yankees opened a new stadium a couple of years ago. And they threatened to move if they didn't get what they wanted. Who believes the New York Yankees were going to move out of New York? That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Yet they were able to use that as a bargaining chip to get the city to pay a lot of money for a stadium. You know, was a team like Jacksonville likely to move in the NFL? Yeah, of course. They should never have been put in Jacksonville in the first place. It's too small. It's just too small a city. This was the entire sports environment. So okay, but even for NFL, which only has 16 games, we'll say, hey, this gives me an excuse to go to my friend's place, you know, 16 times, like $2 per time. It seems like, I mean, are you surprised that you see people gravitate toward, you know, voting in favor? Or, I mean, how do you? No, I, and, well, I don't think anybody really ever uses that as their rationale, for one thing. Um, it, it may be that there are people who do that, but I suspect not. Um, is that a very small amount of money? Well, first, this is 1995 that we were doing this, so we were using data from basically 1968 until 1995. So over that time, you know, prices, incomes were a lot lower. So the $40 that I'm talking about isn't $40 now. It wasn't even really $40 then. Um, but it's not very much money, absolutely. Even, even in 1995, even in you know, 1985, the, sort of the mid, middle of our data, $40 a year isn't all that much. Um, so do I think that it's surprising that we got such a small number? No, I'm actually, I, I'm surprised that we got a number. I'm surprised that we found that it mattered at all. Because, you know, I, as the first couple of slides tried to indicate, Something as big as the Super Bowl. And we think about that as being an enormous event, right? And it's one half of 1% of the annual economy of, of New Orleans. It's not really very much money. At $360 a person, you know, they're gonna give me a check for 360 bucks. Okay, I'll take that, but it's still not that much money. Um, so in that regard, I don't think that the 40 bucks really is is terribly surprising one. I expected it to be zero. Um, and it certainly isn't the positive number that proponents of stadiums and sports-led development would, would tout. They'd say, oh no, that number can't possibly be right. It, it must generate you know, $500 of income per person per year. I don't know how it could, but that's what the kind of thing they would argue. Um, now, my, my feeling is that, you know, that very last slide uh, before this one was, if it generates $40 a year benefit for you, you should vote for it. I'd vote for it on those grounds, even though I think as a public policy, it's a stupid idea. I don't believe it's going to generate income growth. I don't believe it's going to create meaningful jobs. But personally, 40 bucks a year, I definitely get 40 bucks a year benefit. I watch every game of the Ravens on TV. I watch a lot of Orioles games on TV. I don't ever go, but I enjoy following those clubs and certainly $40 a year worth. Other questions?